hello everyone. Uh, officially, good evening. My name is Ginny and uh, I'm with Anderson's Bookshop. So I'd like to welcome you to this virtual author event tonight with Mindy McGinnis and Karen McManus who are trying to keep my tongue all <laughs> in order there. <laughs> M's back and forth as many times as we can, but uh, we're really glad to have you all with us tonight. And of course, to our two fabulous authors. Well, thank you for taking the time to keep your eyes on another screen to talk books with us. For those of you who aren't familiar, Anderson's is an independent bookstore. We are outside Chicago in Naperville and Downers Grove, Illinois. We have been owned and run by the Anderson family for going on six generations since uh, 1875 is our history. So we're very, very proud of that legacy and our uh, involvement in the community. And it also means that your support is really personal to us. Um, if I were at work, I would be sitting in the basement of the bookstore. And uh, you can bet that every time we get a registration in for another event or um, a social media comment or an email feedback, um, it just makes our day. So Thank you very much. We just like to take a moment and say that because it really does matter to us and we really do appreciate it. Uh, normally, we'd be having this person, person this, mm, see, I'm already losing my tongue twister ability. <laughs> we would normally be having this event in person along with over 400 others a year, but hopefully this virtual style keeps us all tied over until we can be together in person again, which I, I hope is this year. I mean, it. I feel like we're moving a little bit somewhere and that makes me feel hopeful so um as someone whose job it is to um welcome people into the bookstore i really do miss that so um yeah. but we have lots of other virtual events coming up until the time that that happens um for all ages interests i uh, would love for you to check those out on our website andersonsbookshop.com or any of our social media handles a um, couple things coming up i'll just let you know Today's Monday. On Wednesday, we have um, the amazing Adam Silvera in conversation with Becky Albertalli, which is another fantastic duo pairing this week. Uh, later this month, Rosaria Munda and uh, Jessica Rubinkowski, who's going to be in conversation with Aaron Craig. So those are some of the big YA ones. But we've got lots coming up, things, big secrets we haven't announced yet. So stay tuned and uh, join us for something else. But tonight, uh, I'm so pleased to welcome Mindy and Karen. We're going to be discussing Mindy's brand new book, The Initial Insult. Uh, Mindy McGinnis is the author of Not a Drop to Drink and its companion in a handful of dust, as well as This Darkness Mine, The Female of the Species, Given to the Sea, Heroine, and the Edgar Award winning novel, A Madness So Discreet. A graduate of Otterbein University with a B in English Literature and Religion, Mindy lives in Ohio. And uh, our moderator this evening, our conversation partner, Karen McManus, earned her BA in, Engli BA in English from the College of the Holy Cross and her MA in Journalism from Northeastern University. As someone from Chicago, I really want that to say Northwestern, but I'm going to read it correctly. It's like Northeastern. <laughs> <laughs> she is the number one New York Times bestselling author of One of Us is Lying, its sequel, One of Us is Next, and Two Can Keep a Secret. Her work has been published in more than 40 languages. So from, from one English BA to two more, welcome ladies, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. Like, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, normally when we have a release, and I know Karen probably back me up on this, we're, we're accustomed to a real hectic week with lots of traveling and, and flying all over. And, and um, I never complained about that lifestyle. Uh, I know some people would just get burnt out on tour, but I was always like, this is awesome. I love it. <laughs> You're an extrovert. <laughs> I, 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 I can be, yes. And I always loved yeah. it. And um, now it's like, you know, it's release week and I've had um, like three or four different virtual events and they're so wonderful. And I love that people up and and you can have great interaction still yeah. but i i do miss that hectic push um yeah so it's very different you know i had one book that came out in january 2020 and one that came out in december 2020 and it was just night and day <laughs> Yeah. Really so, but we make it work and this book is awesome so i'm very excited to talk to you about it awesome so let's get started with just like the elevator pitch. If you can tell us what the initial insult is about and where you got your inspiration from. Sure. So I, you know, sometimes I can say specifically where I got the idea for a book. For the initial insult, I really can't. Uh, but the way that I pitch it these days is I call it the Tiger King meets Edgar Allan Poe, which really is like the best fit. The Tiger King had not Love come that. out uh, when I wrote this book. COVID was not a thing when I wrote this book, yet this book has um, a, a, what we call where I'm from, a white trash zoo, which is someone <laughs> pretty irresponsible who shouldn't have a license for exotic animals. Uh, right. We have one of those when I was growing up in the, the 90s and uh, a cat got out and it was, it was a thing. There was a loose bobcat in the neighborhood. Oh, wow. Like, they were eating pets, like pets were being eaten 
and it attacked a jogger at one point. And it was just a very wild time. So that always stuck with me. That was a little piece of lint that's just always been in my head. Like, what if it was yeah. hot running around in my neighborhood? But uh, so the initial insult takes inspiration from three Edgar Allan Poe short stories, most significantly The Cask of the Montalado, but then also The Black Cat and Mask of the Red Death. So my two main characters, Tress and Felicity, are former BFFs. And in fifth grade, Tress's parents disappeared quite suddenly and overnight and no one ever saw them again. No bodies, no foul play. They were taking Felicity home from an overnight at Tress's house. And she suddenly said that she wanted to go home. Tress didn't know why she had done something wrong. And Felicity is found on a rock near the river soaking wet, but the parents are gone and no one can find them. And Felicity doesn't know what happened. She cannot remember. So fast forward to senior year, Tress has now for seven years been living with her grandfather who owns and runs the, owns the uh, zoo, animal attractions. <laughs> yes. And um, she really fell in social economic status when she had to go live with her grandfather. She was well off and suddenly is not, fell from grace in this small town. And she really blames Felicity. And yeah. she takes the opportunity one night at a big house party, a Halloween costume party in an abandoned mansion out in the middle of nowhere to basically brick Felicity up in a coal chute in the basement and slowly say, you know, I really want to know what happened to my parents, but first and she'll pick up a brick and be like, we're going to talk about what you did to me in seventh grade. And so she'll lay yeah. a brick every insult that she can imagine you actually did that <laughs> did that it's I amazing <laughs> yeah and it and it um you know obviously the stakes get higher as, as the wall gets higher also at the same time there is a horrible uh social media event going on upstairs and uh the panther is loose and a uh, stomach virus is ripping through the entire party. So all of these things converge. A wild animal revenge, former BFFs, social media gone terribly bad, and a lot of puking. Actually, one of the yeah. things that I, I sent an email to my editor, the title of which was, how much puking is too much puking? While I, <laughs> while I was writing so, this book. And what is the official answer on that? <laughs> Do we and have we'll a number? Edits and we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I got away with a lot. There's quite a bit yes. in there. Yeah. I mean, that is like the perfect summary because that is just, it's like the perfect storm, right? Of like all these uh, like incredibly dramatic, quite traumatic things happening at once. And at the core, you've got this friendship gone very, very wrong. And I think, you know, the first time you mentioned the book to me, you, you use those comps. It was like, the Tiger King meets Edgar Allan Poe. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. you drew inspiration from three different Poe stories. What is it you think about like Poe's work that is still like so relevant and works so well within our modern like YA thriller genre? I think, so he wasn't afraid to go there. He was writing things that, you know, people, people were alarmed by his content and people were, like simultaneously turned off yet attracted to it and uh people weren't sure how to receive it or how to interact with it yeah. i kind of have the same problem so it's like very often people people will read my books and then they're like i don't know whether i can say i enjoyed it or not they're like that's a hard word to fit into this but they're yes, like, I can't but they can't put it down right yeah yeah exactly, exactly. and so i think poe especially um just uh, being able to face like the hard, the hard things and, and ask the hard questions and, and really kind of pull away that veil of polite society. Yeah. I have always appreciated that. And my work reflects it for sure. Yeah. And I think you're, he's unflinching, you know, and that's what this book is. Um, so this is book, is this book number 10 for you? That's 10. 
Wow. Okay. First of all, like applause, because that's amazing. You know, in our very you know challenging industry, that's incredible. Um, and you write, you know, kind of across a lot of different genres. But what would you say is kind of like the Mindy McGinnis like stamp in a book? Like, what do your readers expect to see, and what do you think they got? How did they get that in the initial insult? Uh, great question. So yes, I do. I'm very fortunate. My editors trust me and my publishing house trusts me and they let me hop around, which isn't common. So I've written uh, post-apocalyptic, I've written historical mysteries, thrillers, psychological thrillers, um, fantasy. The only thing you're not gonna get out of me is a romance. I've been divorced like twice. So like that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but um, I'm probably not a romance. I'm probably not a sci-fi because I'm not, I don't think I'm qualified to write that. Yeah. But, Everything else is kind of fair game for me. The distinctive thing that I think it runs across all of my books is just, you know, using the word unflinching again, uh, grit and yeah. an unflinching look at humanity, just the good and the ugly, because every single one of us has both of those things inside. And that is reflected very much in the book because while Felicity is, you know, supposedly the, you know, pretty rich mean girl, every story that trust has it's like you did this thing to me this is an event this happened and it traumatized me and you did it you also get felicity's point of view you get yeah. that event from felicity's point of view and you realize that things aren't so black and white and there isn't a good girl and a bad girl and they need to figure that out before somebody dies Yes. And I was very primed to be very angry at Felicity after the first chapter, you know, because Tress goes first and we've got her point of view and it all sounds pretty horrible. And then you get to Felicity's side and, you know, there's we don't know everything. So no. I, I love how you do that. And I mean, that's kind of a great lead into what I want to talk about next, which is like the multi POV, which is something that I do in all of my books and I love to do. And so in this book, you've got, you know, our obviously our two best friends, um, Tress and Felicity. And you also have a cat. <laughs> You've got that cat on the loose, which is amazing. So what was it like balancing those three very different narrators? So it's a great question. Um, Tress, Tress is very gritty. Tress is very salt of the earth just because she's been raised by a, basically an old man that is grouchy and an alcoholic. So. <laughs> she is she's become like a really hard tough character felicity is is what you would expect yet with some more internality than you would assume more self-reflection more and, and you know you would look at felicity from the outside and like she's beautiful she's the most popular girl in school she's rich like she's doing well felicity right. hates herself she absolutely yeah. hates herself and that you, once you get to know her, you see it and, and you understand why and you have empathy for her. So using those POVs and like visiting the same scene, but seeing it through someone else's eyes really helps you to understand like almost the, um, the fluidity of reality, which yeah. brings me to the cat because the cat is, and I can tell you, like I decided like, I'm going to write from the POV of a panther. And then I was like, and how does one do that right so <laughs> it's a fair question <laughs> yeah i i had the idea and then i was like great idea how do you execute that so i mean i had to first like just make the assumption that the cat is going to use words and speak english just so we sure. can understand right <laughs> um but beyond that i wrote him uh in verse because I don't think that uh, an animal is going to be thinking in necessarily like complete sentences and logic and linear thinking. Yeah. So I wrote him in, in verse. So you're getting a lot of feelings and emotion and perceptions from him. But then also uh, I enter, I introduced an element of uh, magic in a way into the book because I have uh, like four cats and anybody that has a cat, Sometimes you will see your cat interacting with something that is not there. Cat will just be like, oh. it sees something and it looks and it follows something and it kind of goes like this and there's nothing there. Yeah. And I have had my cats, two cats at the same time, interact simultaneously with something that is not there. And that is scary. So it's Ghosts. like, yes, it's like I, when I've seen this happen multiple times and I'm just like, Cats uh, 
obviously are, are what you looking at guys <laughs> yeah there's 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 different things going on here cats see things we don't multiple universes the cats are in so the way i use that element with the panther was to give him access to his nine lives because he has nine lives mm -hmm. the cat and if he he calls it being very still and very quiet he can kind of slip through time and if he goes beyond very still and very quiet to being stone in silence which is what he calls it he can interact with that past time yes. so the cat at one point is in the house with all the drunk teenagers and Tress knows that he's there because she's also monitoring this live stream that's going on upstairs directly above their heads that is getting wildly out of control with her cousin Ribbit as the victim and she's trying to monitor that and she sees the cat's tail like slipping off screen and she's like oh that is not good because her that's grandfather next level her. right there <laughs> yeah her grandfather calls her and says hey the panther's loose and she's like i'm busy i have my best friend <laughs> i'm trying to brick someone into a I basement am, okay I, my hands are literally full but tress tress actually ends up trapping the panther in one of the upstairs uh bedrooms she shuts she goes in she finds him she shuts the door and the panther's like well i'm going to sit here and be very still and very silent and he just sits kind of like meditating until he has put himself in the room in a time when that door was open and then he just walks out and i'm just like oh you sneaky cat <laughs> <laughs> it was so wild to read his point of view i loved it and it you know it really added a lot to the tension because yeah. you can kind of you know you know a little bit about what this cat is thinking and planning and it's pretty scary yeah that was great so I love that, you know, this is like a, an old friendship gone wrong, um, you know, sort of childhood friends are one of my favorite themes, you know, one of those things I revisit over and over again, especially for some reason, fifth grade, I don't know, there's something about fifth grade and then high school that is, is, is an interesting time span, I guess. So what did you want to kind of explore with that? friendship and in the span of time with these two different girls and you know did, did you draw from anything in your own experience or just sort of like the general arc of a friendship that didn't work out i think i so i'm from a very very rural community um your friends are your friends because geographically this has been dictated to you there Even they are you have to interact with yeah. um and i'm i'm from a very very small school in a very small place so we didn't really have like clicks uh you know there were people that were more popular but for the most part it's like you could move between like you could be a smart girl and an athlete and a band member and you know still be like attractive like you didn't you weren't you weren't like, You're not pigeonholed so much. yeah yeah that didn't happen so a lot of the times the friends that you had from a young age continued to be your friends. Uh, you know, there was some shuffling around and moving around. I did have some friends that I was probably closer with when I was younger that things changed because again, super small town. Yeah. My parents grew up with their parents, right? Right, so, right. So that my parents are their parents' friends. So our parents get together and you're friends because you're going to end up spending time together. And then you get older and you know, you have a license and you're able to drive and like have a little bit more freedom and going to other people's houses, choosing your own friends kind of thing. But like for the most part, where I'm from, you stay close with the people that you've been with since kindergarten. Um, and that can mean that it's really hard to shift out of some assumptions in right. a small town. And that's something that I touch on a lot in the book, uh, that your last name means everything in this right. small town. And that it's true where I'm from. And, um, it's, it's very true in small towns, uh, because for one thing, people don't leave. So I can tell you just as someone in the school system that, you know, I know all the last names and I have, um, you know, for the good or for the bad, I can make some assumptions based on looking at their last names about right. what this person is going to be like. So, and that's not fair. So that's something that um, I also wrote into the book. And I think it is very distinctive to small town. 
And I also think that because, you know, you can't you can't suddenly not be friends anymore and still not see each other. Right. No matter, right. No matter how bad it was, no matter how horrible this thing yeah. was that happened. And the same is true about breaking up with someone. You go through a bad breakup. You're going to see them every day in the hall. You're going to see them kissing their new girlfriend or boyfriend every day in the hall. Right. And the new boyfriend or girlfriend is probably your cousin because that's how things <laughs> go around here. Like it's, it's really small. So you can't, you can't like pick people to avoid. You're all operating in a very small tin can. So that's part of the problem for Felicity and Tress. Like at one point, Felicity who has panic attacks, like even at the sound of Tress's name, first day of high school, finds out that her locker is next to Tress's locker. And she's like, I, right. I can't do that. I can't, I can't look at her. Like she loses cause she blames herself for everything that went wrong in Tress's life. Trust views this as like, oh, I don't want to have anything. I don't want to be around her when it's yeah. actually just like, I have so much guilt. I can't look at you. Right, right, right. And I thought that was really well done to see both of their perspectives on that same sort of formative experience in their like post friendship years, you know, when they're still kind of circling each other. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the setting was I think perfect for this type of story because like to your point, no one can escape, <laughs> you know, like they're stuck with each other. It's not easy for them to go someplace else. Um, so it was set in Appalachian, Ohio. Um, yeah. What else kind of appealed to you besides a small town setting? Was there, were there other elements that you wanted to make sure and bring out in the atmosphere? Um, definitely that small town and of course the uh, the claustrophobia of that but it's also compounded by the fact that this story takes place over one night right this entire novel takes place over one night and um, the sequel takes place over three days so you know that there's a countdown and you know that you know the party has to end sometime the live stream has to end sometime you know the sun is coming up the yeah, bricks yeah. are getting higher, right? Like, how is this going to end? And so you have that claustrophobia of the small town, like reduced, boiled down even farther into the claustrophobia of everyone is here in this tiny house. Like all the kids that are going to party, which is most of them, are here in this in this old crumbling mansion, which has its own like inferences of, of time and the decay that this town has seen and the loss of... Uh, status that trust has felt and so yeah like it's all compounding in this like thick sludgy atmosphere of you cannot escape yeah and you know that really uh, obviously affects felicity intensely she's shackled <laughs> to a wall being bricked up she cannot escape but trust can't escape her past her yeah. parents are gone. They were taken from her and no one either knows or will tell her what happened. And that's such a good mystery that underpins the story. So, you know, as a fellow mystery writer, I have to ask you your, you know, sort of process question here and no spoilers, but did you always know what happened to Tress's parents? Or did you start this with kind of a like, they definitely disappeared and right. we'll figure out the rest later. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think I did know because I mm -hmm. tend to write by the seat of my pants. I tend to not know what's going to happen in my books. I find that to be the most interesting way for me to go about writing a book. If I already know what happened, then I'm not sure that, that I can keep that intensity up for myself yeah. as I'm working. So I do like, we'll have a general idea. Like I knew whether they were dead or not, for example, because yeah. there is, it is a question. They may still be alive. So I was working from that base assumption as to whether or not they were dead or alive. And um, as the story began to come together, I came to some conclusions about what had happened, especially in um, press or Felicity's memories, because mm -hmm. Felicity has much more access to the truth than she believes that she has. Right. And uh, she also has a drug problem, uh, a lot of that due to that self-hatred, and she ends up in this situation where she's been hit on the head with a brick, uh, she was drunk, and uh, a bad night for Felicity. a couple of, like, uh, downers at the same time, and then she catches, she's got the virus, so she's, like, in very bad shape, so she's in this, like, 
quasi subconscious state by the end of the book and these things start coming back to her things that happen that she is she has really kept a lid on so those things were kind of revealed to me in the same way that they were revealed to felicity just as okay. I these things would come yeah yeah that's so interesting so what was the most interesting or maybe weirdest piece of research you had to do for this book um oh that's a good question so <laughs> So, um, what would put you on an FBI watch list, for example, or <laughs> oh, I, I'm confident that I'm confident just based on, so my research for a madness, so discreet, which is set in, um, an insane asylum in the 1890s that got me, first of all, the weirdest based on your search history oh, <laughs> options on Amazon. It was like, here, you might enjoy this ball gag. And I'm like, no. <laughs> No, no, I don't think I, I would not. Like, <laughs> no, you can do that. Um, but yeah, I, I, for this one, I had to do a lot of research, um, like honestly about dehydration because ah. Felicity is suffering and she is chained up and I have to keep her alive. Right. And I had to do a lot of research about that. Uh, also blood loss. Tress is very, very badly injured at one point. So I had to learn, uh, like, how much blood do you really need kind of thing? Um, <laughs> how much can you lose and still function? Yeah. Still function. Um, but also I had to, I had to learn quite a bit about panthers. Um, not necessarily just panthers, but big cats. How do yeah. they operate? Like, what, what do they, what, what, how would they behave in this situation where there is just literally a smorgasbord of their choosing. They can eat any human they want. These humans are sick and weak and right. drunk and, yep. and completely helpless. Very <laughs> easy prey. Oh, super easy prey. So uh, interestingly enough, I did work in a high school for 14 years. I was a librarian. And one of my students, who is also my neighbor, because that's where I live, she uh, it works in a big cat sanctuary. Ooh. She got, uh, she's you a saw. zookeeper. She got her zookeeper license. And I don't remember whether she had texted me out of nowhere. Oh, that's what it was. Interestingly enough, she texted me out of nowhere because she found a stray cat, weirdly enough. And um, she texted me and she was like, hey, Miss McGinnis, I found this cat, like took a picture of the cat. And she's like, is this your sister's cat? Because my sister is also her English teacher. Again, this is where I'm from. Yeah. So she, and she's like 25, 26 at this rate. She might even be almost 30. I don't know. But she texted me and I didn't have her number in my phone. And it was just like, hey, is this your cat? And it was just this picture. And I'm like, <laughs> this like a ransom note? I was <laughs> Is that my cat? Do you have it? Have cat. And, I was, and I texted back and I was like, uh, I was like, no, that's not my cat. Oh, who is this? You know? And she was like, hey, it's so-and-so, you know, from, from down the road, basically. And I was like, oh, and I was like, hey, I have a question for you because I knew that she had become a zookeeper. Yeah. She told me that she actually worked and like did an internship at a big cat sanctuary. And I was like, you and I are going to have a long talk now. And so she was a great resource for me. Um, there's a little bit of a story uh, in the book about uh, Tress feeding the panther. And it comes directly from my student's experience. Um, she, my student, had um, basically they, this big cat sanctuary, I believe it's in Indiana. It was near a, um, like a dairy farm. And if they had a cow that died for whatever reason, you know, they can't, if it died like from an illness or something that it can't be used for human consumption. Right. So they would give it to the cat sanctuary. So my student, one of her jobs was to take a chainsaw, cut off a bull's head. And then like, basically she told me, she like literally had a decapitated bull holding the head by the horns and has the skull like on her back. And she's walking into a paddock. Wow that all the cats are on the other side, but they're going wild. Like there's, she's like, there's blood running all the way down oh, my back, yeah. filling Cat my boots. Christmas right there. Yeah, and she's like, I'm covered in blood 
and I just kind of take this, you know, and I drop it there into the paddock and then I just run, run. <laughs> <laughs> shut the door behind me. And then they open up the door and they let the, they let the cats into the paddock with the head of the bull. Wild. But I, I used something like I lifted that like directly out of her life because it, for trust, because it is so crazy. That is. But that was like in 20, like 18, this, this teenager is carrying a decapitated bull's head to feed to wild animals. And everybody's like, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, this is just part of your job. I was going to ask you if you have a favorite scene. Is is that it? <laughs> that's one of them. Also, like anything with the cat. Um, at one point, Tress uh, is, is quite, I don't know if she's just like emotionally drained or, or she's having a moment. And she's with the cat. It's when she has trapped the cat in the bedroom and she's just kind of sitting there because she's come to realize that perhaps Felicity doesn't know what happened to her parents. And at this point, Tress has half killed her and committed felonies. And she's just like, shit, am I going to have to kill her? Like just to protect myself now. And for some reason, Tress, like she, she decides to like get the cat's opinion. So she's, <laughs> she's, she's up there. And she's just like talking to the cat because she took very good care of her animals. And so she, you know, she does have a relationship with this animal and it just very casually reaches out and slices her open. Greatly injures her. Yes. That was actually one of my favorite scenes also. Yeah. And that, that she was being vulnerable favorite. with the cat. You know, she thought that they had that kind of relationship and the cat's yeah. like, yeah, no, we don't. And the cat's just like, no. And he just like bats her. And, you know, it basically takes part of her arm off because yeah. it's a wild animal. And that's a big theme in the, in the story too, is that, you know, a wild animal, a trapped animal, a cornered animal is going to behave violently. Right. And, and that Dangerous. is what trust is. And that is what felicity yeah. is too. So, right. yeah. So basically we can't wait for the conclusion. Um, so this is a duology, right? And you've written um, both series and standalones. Do you always know when you start that it's going to be a standalone versus a series? Is that something that sometimes changes as you I go on? I tend to know simply you know. because <laughs> there's so much content there. So for the the first half here of uh, the Poe books. So the initial insult, uh, which came out on Tuesday. And then the second one is called The Last Laugh. <clears throat> so that comes out probably February of 2022. And I knew that there was no way I could cover the past and the mystery of Tress's parents and what's going down right now between these two girls in one book. Um, yeah. So what I ended up doing was the mystery of the past covers both of the books. The present, the showdown between Felicity and Tress is very securely settled at the end of this book. Um, and then the fallout from how that plays out is all book two. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> I expect an arc in oh, my yeah. desk oh, as soon as possible all right <laughs> I'm, I'm very very excited about the second one i i just finished um setting up uh you know the the copy edits or i'm sorry the edits are done and and uh so we're just waiting for copy edits so it's done it's put away um nice. you know i know what happens uh, which is a relief because i don't always but yes it's always it good <laughs> helps so last question and then we'll i think we probably have some here so we can take a look at those um just for my own benefit here, you're so productive with your books and, and releasing them once a year at least, or maybe more. So like, what's your process? How do you stay so motivated and just turn out such great books so quickly? Uh, it's all at the expense of my personal relationships. That's okay. <laughs> That's, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. That's the answer. That's uh, great. That's <laughs> full isolation. No, um, I, so I work quickly. Um, I will, I will percolate, I call it percolating. I will percolate a book in my head for six to nine months. And then when it's time for me to actually write it, even though I don't know, it's like, I've got the theme and the feel and yeah. I will sit and usually I can write a full, a novel in two to three months. And, uh, that's a first draft. So, you know, it needs yeah. some more, but I can write a novel in two to three months. So you know, a lot of people say, how can you like write a book a year? And I'm like, I 
actually write more than one book a year. It's just that only one is released. <laughs> um, I write quickly. I'm fortunate that way. It's um, it's just the way my brain works. Um, also, I treat it like a job. I would never claim that I write every day because I don't. Um, yeah, and I same. actually dislike that writing advice because I feel like aspiring writers or people that want to write, they hear that advice right every day. And they think either I can't, I don't have time. I have a real job or a family. I must not be a writer or they think I don't actually want to write every day. Right. And I'm like, guess what? Me neither. I mean, that's, yeah. no, it's hard. No, same. Some days you just don't want to go there. You know, it's, it's just an not admin day. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I will fight it. I will. I defrosted my freezer one time instead of going. <laughs> I was just like, no, nah, we're going to defrost the freezer. That's what we're doing today. Um, but yeah, productivity. Um, I do a lot. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to downplay it. <clears throat> um, so I do like release at least one book a year under my real name. I also write under a pen name with um, a couple other friends of mine. Uh, everybody gets really excited when I say this and they're like, oh my gosh, tell us your pen name. The truth is that number one, I can't because <laughs> it's not, it's not, you wouldn't want to read those books. They are not Mindy McGinnis books. They are <laughs> quick, fun, silly beach reads kind of things. Um, I do have that side to me. It's not my author brand. So um, I write things under a pen name. I started writing with two friends of mine and in September of like 2019, and I think we've released 12 books since then. So wow. yes, but there's three of us working. So it's not, yeah. Just me. yeah. So uh, that, and I, I have um, other projects on the side that um, I haven't been announced yet. So I can't talk about, but um, I have uh, so many irons in the fire. I have a podcast uh, and a blog called writer, writer, pants on fire which is for aspiring writers. And which I found very helpful when I was querying and especially so like getting ready to go on submission, you know, cause nobody talks about submission. So it's really hard to find information about like, what is that even like and what can I expect from the process? So yep. your blog was very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. I've been blogging since 2011 and it's one of those things that every now and then I'm like, I should really stop doing this. And then, I'm, and then I'll get an email from someone that they're like, hey, you know, I really appreciate this resource. And I'm like, all right, I'll keep doing it. So <laughs> I've been doing that for a long time. And um, I also, um, let's see, what else do I do? Oh, I offer, uh, I do freelance editing on the side. So um, I, I read quite a few, quite a few um, like aspiring writers, pages, yeah. novels, really synopsises to, to help them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, basically my entire life was words. <laughs> so no sleeping whatsoever. <laughs> I'm really good at sleeping, actually. You yeah. would you would be amazed at how well I sleep. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually the last comment we got in the chat was when do you sleep? So <laughs> thanks for answering that one. <laughs> Deeply and very well. Good for you. Well, we have some questions. Um, do you want to, we can address those if you'd like, or you guys have oh, more? Yeah, sure. that's Sounds good. All right. Well, I want to start with this one from, um, what's well, says, hi, I'm Nikolai and I'm 12. How do you come up with your titles? Oh, hi, Nikolai. Um, so a good job being 12. It is not easy to be 12 right now. I, I seriously, yeah. wow. Okay. Um, so for this particular book, uh, the initial insult, the title is drawn from the Poe short story, Cask of Amontillado. And the first line is something like, um, I, the many insults of Fortunato I had worn. And it's just about uh, this guy who, these two guys that uh, one of them feels like the other has constantly been insulting him his whole life. And so he comes up with this trick to get him into a wine cellar and break him up in the wall. And so that title comes from more or less is drawn loosely from that first line of the cask of Amontillado. Now the scene is called the last laugh and it gets its title loosely from the very last line of a lesser known Edgar Allan Poe short story called Hop Frog, which is very important to the plot of the last laugh. I pull a lot of my, I'm an English major. And I need to use that major in some way. 
Got it. So <laughs> I, I really rely on, um, on, on references. So my very first book is called Not a Drop to Drink. That is pulled from Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The second book is titled In a Handful of Dust. That's pulled from T.S. Eliot. Um, then I have a book called A Madness So Discreet, which is actually pulled out of Romeo and Juliet. So that is from Shakespeare. And The Female of the Species is from a Rudyard Kipling poem. And so I'm just always looking for ways to show that I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do something with that English degree. <laughs> yes. I mean, you just said you deal in words every day. I feel like that counts, you know. But yeah. I mean, you have many former professors that are very happy to hear you, like all your lit professors, right? You're... Yeah. They're like, look, Mindy uses titles that matter. No, right. I, I, actually, I will say... I have had, oh, and I should add the, This Darkness Mine, another one of my books, that's pulled from Shakespeare as well. That's a, that's a uh, Tempest nod. That's such a great um, title. I really oh, like that thank one. Thank you. I, I can't, Shakespeare's, I can't really, like, everybody's like, we love your titles. And I'm like, I literally wrote none of them. They are all, <laughs> <laughs> other people did it better first. And I'm but just saying. you did saying, get to keep them. I mean, not, you know, not all titles stay the same after you submit a manuscript, so. I did. And that is the one thing that I can say is that um, my titles stick. And that is not common. No, so, it's not. That's a talent yeah. right there. So I was going to say, yeah, Karen, Good did job. you have that experience too? Did your titles um, flip around? Yeah. One of us is lying. I came up with, she can keep a secret. My editor came up with, I was calling it the name of the town. I just could not come up with a title for that one. Um, one of us is next was mine. Um, the cousins was mine. I didn't think that was going to stick. It was a like placeholder title. And then we just kept calling it that. And we're like, let's just call it that. Um, <laughs> and I actually think it suits the book really well, even though it's different from my other books. Um, mm -hmm. You'll be the death of me. I came up with. Oops, sorry, my phone is like beeping at me. And um, my newest yeah, one a little bit ago, so. <laughs> does not quite have a title yet. We're still working on that. But I find titles hard. Like at the beginning, I almost never have them. And like one of us is lying was a line from the book that I came yeah. across as I was editing it, and I was like, "There we go." I had been calling it "Breakfast Club Murder" until then, which was obviously yeah. not going to like work. You know? right. right? No, I, I did the same thing. So my book be not far from me. So that's actually from the Bible. That's that's from Adam and Eve's story. And um, I was calling it drunk hatchet with a girl. Like for the <laughs> long time. Like that was how I that's what it was in my head. And my editor was like, we do need a title. And I was like, well, it is about a girl like out in nature and there's a boy involved. So I'm like, okay, well, we can do like an Adam and Eve kind of feel and and so be not far from me came yeah. came from came from the Bible. That's funny you should reference Hatchet because we just had our um, children's literature breakfast on virtually on Saturday and Gary Paulson was one of our speakers. So um, that's like- I'm sure he'd be thrilled to know that I call my book Drunk Hatchet. <laughs> he would though. I mean- I think he would be flattered. He absolutely would. He, I hope he's so. <laughs> just that kind of guy. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, people think that, you know, an author writes a manuscript and you give it to a publishing house and submit it and it's accepted and it is fully formed. You know, I think sure, people yeah. have this perception where it's, if there's a title that you made and it goes and you have input on the cover and like, none of that is necessarily true. <laughs> we also don't get to choose if our books become movies. So, you know. <laughs> but I mean, you don't get to cast them, really? No. Can't cast no. them. We really no. don't. <laughs> yes. I do. I, I do enjoy it when people ask me that just because it's sweet, like, cause they want to see it, but yeah, because well, yeah, they're excited. It's wonderful. But they're like, are you going to make your book into a movie? And I'm like, no, because I'm not a movie studio. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I, I, Call up your friend, Steve Spielberg. And just, right. you know, I mean, I, I know literally zero people in Hollywood, so right, I, right, I am right. not going to make my book into a movie. Someone else is welcome to do that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, well, it was some follow-up from Nikolai who says, no, it isn't easy being 12. Uh, <laughs> his mom had signed him up and is commenting and he's a big reader. So thank you, Nikolai, uh, yes, for that question and for being a big reader and for, uh, sticking it out as a 12 year old right now. I have a 12 year old too, and I can, <laughs> I can feel your pain there for sure. Super uh, hard. All right. So, uh, Jennifer is an English teacher. So hello yeah. more, more English in the world. I always like asking authors, what was the last book you totally geeked out about and what are you dying to get your hands on? Oh, so I have to admit that the pandemic has really crushed my reading. I have not been reading much. Um, I can't really identify why. Um, You're I not do alone. Think, like I said, I know. And it, it's so like, this is the thing that is, that is I, 
the pandemic was made for this and it's just like no i can't read them um I, a lot of it is just i mean actual eye strain because i do look at words all day um but also um just a lot of things were leaving me flat and it was a discredit to the actual books because there's nothing wrong with them i just wasn't like emotionally interacting with them because it's the pandemic and I'm not emotionally interacting with anything anymore except yeah. my dog. Yeah. So I, I have not read something. Now there is an exception. Um, I had to, I, I had the opportunity to sign thousands of uh, slip in pages for a uh, book box that featured the initial insult. And I, ha I, ha I volunteered. I said I would sign every single page. So I had thousands of pages to sign my name on, which is a lovely, you know, blessing to have. So I listened to an audiobook while I was doing it. And there was, it's a book called, it's a memoir called When Breath Becomes Air. Oh, yes. It was written by a doctor. And um, he was a lung surgeon and very, very, very skilled. And he died of lung cancer. And he basically oh, died God. of the cancer that he was specifically had been treating and like had trained himself oh. to, to remove. Um, and it was really, really good. And it was his memoir and he started writing it when he knew that he wasn't going to have long to live more than likely. And he wanted to, to write his story and he did, and he did pass away. And the epilogue was written by his wife. And, um, I, for whatever reason, I'm very rarely moved. Um, you know, usually when a dog dies in a book, that'll get me, but that's what it takes. And, um, the epilogue is written by his wife and I was sitting there like signing these pages and I was like, Oh, <laughs> like trying, trying to write. So if anybody from bookish box gets a slightly like pure state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It says I was reading a book. Well, that's called, special. <laughs> when that's breath becomes thing. air. And it got me. Like it, it got me pretty, pretty, pretty hard when his wife and then um they made the decision to have a baby. And uh so you know she he had he got to meet his baby before he passed away. And so it was just it was just all just horrific. And yeah. I so I was bawling. Really very good. heartbreaking well, it's there. like when chadwick boseman's uh wife <laughs> spoke last night on his behalf at the golden globes i was like i, yeah. done. I can't yeah. i can't I can't do it yeah karen what about you what's um what you what's i geeked out about i recently really loved um it's a pretty new release it's called um the girls i've been by tess sharp and it's a thriller and it's about a girl who is in the middle of a bank robbery with her girlfriend and her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and it's just like, she has to draw on her, bass, her past as the child of a con woman to get them out of the situation. It's really good. It's going to be, um, I think, either a series or a movie on Netflix with Millie Bobby Brown. So nice. definitely check that out. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I just put a couple of links in the chat there to those books if anybody is interested in picking up a copy. Um, is there anything you guys are just dying to get your hands on? I can't believe I have not yet gotten my hands on Courtney Summers' latest because I'm a giant Courtney Summers fan girl and the project came out like two weeks ago, but I have not hit my deadline and so I have not, not read allowed. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've been on uh, the audio waiting list for um, They're There by Tommy Orange mm -hmm. uh, for my, my local library. So I'm, I'm waiting to get, I had it and I got to listen to like half of it and expired. So, so I'm waiting to finish They're There by Tommy Orange. That was, that was one, but it's out. Uh, so that is available. Yes, I can't available. say that there's anything else that I'm particularly dying for right now. I, like I said, my, my, um, my, my reading has gone down and that has been that has been, uh, you know, that hasn't been easy. I've never been a person that ever needed to <laughs> not read. You know, I was like, I would be, I would be like, I'm going to go to bed at 7.30 PM so that I can read, right? And, and it's like, that's what I did. I would go to bed early and read, and, <clears throat> you know, stay up until 3 AM. And that was me like my whole life. And now very suddenly, I'm just, nothing has my interest. Very few things are, are catching my eye. And I think it's just, um, you know, just the, it's the pandemic. 
Yeah. 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 You're Definitely. not alone there. There we had, I mean, it's, it's my job to read books, you know, other booksellers that work with me and, and we were a lot of us having that, that issue too, that it's just, it's hard to focus. You know, there were yeah. times where I was like, how it felt like I felt too guilty to yeah. read, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy and I'm not worrying about anyone right this moment. I know that close to me that has COVID, you know, at the time. And it just, yeah. It's, it's I hard think to feel that. Part of it for me is, is actual guilt because I mean, I already worked from home. My job is homebound and uh, publishing, if anything, not indie bookstores, don't get me wrong, but publishing itself, you know, all, uh, did well during COVID. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, people that was, it's a common question on panels and in chats, like how has COVID changed your life? And it's like, it really hasn't, which, I mean, I don't get to do appearances and I don't get to uh, speak in public anymore. And that has bummed me out to a very great extent, but I am not affected in the way that people that have lost their jobs and that are being evicted and, you know, like that, that hasn't touched me. And so uh, I think you're right. I think guilt could be a very huge part of that. It's like, I'm laying here in my warm house with my, you know, Dalmatian reading, <laughs> reading a book and uh, I feel bad. Yeah. Karen, what about for you? How has, uh, how has COVID changed your writing process or your reading process? Um, you know, I had just turned in my fifth book um, in January of 2020, and then it came back to me in March. And so I felt like I was kind of lucky in some ways, because the first thing I had to do work-wise was within a universe I'd already created, you know, it's just like different than that sort of really heavy lifting creatively of building a new world. So I got that off and I was feeling good, like, yeah. I'm productive in the pandemic. And then I had to write my sixth book and I really did struggle with that. It was like a summer worth of struggling where I just couldn't, you know, I wasn't motivated. I I didn't like anything I wrote. I didn't understand these characters. It took me a lot longer than it, it normally does to get into a groove with that book. And I got there, but it, it took a while. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a different world for sure. I, remain shocked that one of the, for several months after things shut down um, a year ago, that books about pandemics were so popular, (laughs) you know, whether it be the, the, the flu, the Spanish flu or any of the other, you know, I just was, it felt so strange, but people processed and coped in different ways. Right. And that's what books are there for. So I don't think that those authors ever expected. <laughs> their books no, no. 2021. No. I think I saw the first like actual, you know, book about the pandemic introduced in the YA sphere recently. So I was like, oh, we're at that point. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, we had a couple others right late summer to do a virtual event that um, they were like sort of the post-apocalyptic that kind of because of like a, re- a weird illness kind of a thing and they hadn't intended right. to be pandemic books, but... Yeah. That's what it became, you know. Um, all right, a question here from Callie. Mindy, will you ever write books for adults? Yeah, uh, definitely. That's something that I really want to do. And uh, interesting uh, dovetail with our last uh, conversation there. I uh, had a have a adult novel that is finished. And what I had written was basically... Um, this a story of two mothers in the same location 100 years apart so it was uh again southern ohio on the river appalachia and it was a story in 1918 of the spanish flu and then in 2018 a mother uh just like you know operating in poverty and trying to keep her child alive in poverty and get health care and take care of her child and in the 1918 flu of, of course the influenza the mother is trying to save her child from influenza. And so it, it, again, a focus on a small town and the way your last name follows you and uh, the descendants of these people from 1918, how you see them in 2018 and uh, you know how things have changed and not changed in a hundred years in motherhood. And so I have this finished book and uh, I turned it uh, and I, my agent read it and then friends read it and my agent said, you know, I think the 2018 storyline is really strong. I'm not buying 1918. And then my friends that are writers were like, I love the 1918. <laughs> I don't like the 2018. 
was like, okay, this book just actually isn't working then. Like these, these two storylines aren't connecting. I'm just going to set it aside. Right. And so now I like, you know, COVID hit and I emailed my agent and I was like, so do I re rewrite this with 1918 influenza and 2020 pandemic? And she was like, you know, we can set that aside and we can think about it. It could be viewed as insensitive. So you have to consider that. And I was like, okay. So that is, you know, it's a genuine concern. So I do have like that particular book that I would love to get out someday. It truly like isn't working. It's not a functional mm -hmm. manuscript right now. I, and I don't know why. I can't figure out why, but I can't get it to work. Um, I have other ideas for adult books. Um, my pen name does write adult books, so there's that. But uh, yeah, I, I have so many plans that I need another me to, to, to make <laughs> clone. <laughs> yeah, I really do. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's interesting you talk about that things that if you were to publish something about a pandemic, it would almost feel insensitive now is that um, I've seen a lot of books coming out in the fall because it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And it wow. seems where it's, there's this window now where it might be okay. I mean, Alan Gratz is doing a, a book by for kids and so are a couple other people. And um, there seems to be that, that window. We've had adult fiction, but I don't know that we've had anything big in the kids world. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely that window when it, whatever that may be. I hope it's not 20 years till we can start addressing it because it's going to have such an impact on, oh, on our, everything. you know, yeah. In addition, yeah. so for sure. Um, all right. So best of books. Hello, best of books. Uh, it says Mindy, I saw that you were, co uh, you wrote a book with James Patterson. What's it like to co-write? You did talk about this a little bit before. Yeah. Um, so it, it made it out onto the internet. I believe it, uh, went up like over the weekend. Uh, so yes, I am co-authoring a book with James Patterson. It is the second in the Hawk series. So Hawk is Maximum Ride's daughter. So I get to write in the Maximum Ride series, which was extraordinarily exciting for me because I was a librarian when Maximum Ride was coming out and all right, the kids yeah. were just like so into it. And it was like, I could put that book in, in a kid's hands and I knew they were going to read it mm -hmm. and, and come back and ask me for the next one. And so, there's nothing better than that feeling. <laughs> exactly. Like that's <laughs> yes. easy. It's like, you want a book? There's a book. And um, like, it didn't matter who I gave it to. Everyone loved it. So I had the opportunity to work on this series with her daughter, Hawk, and uh, it was so much fun. And uh, James Patterson is just so kind and, and easy to work with. My experience was wonderful. Um, kind of like having an extra grandpa. Like, I'm not gonna lie, he was just so <laughs> sweet. Like whenever he talked to me, he would, you know, he would ask if I was okay. And if things were, were going all right where I live and, um, you know, always inquiring about the, 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 you know, aspects of my life and just like really making sure that I was okay before we even talked about work. So great experience, loved it. Really looking forward to that book going out into the world in November. Amazing, yeah. So of course he's a, a famous champion for librarians and teachers and independent bookstores. So love him as well. And Karen, have you co-written anything? I have not. Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like I would not be a good co-writer because I'm a little bit of a control freak. <laughs> but you know, with the right co-author, it could work. I do think it would be fun. You know, I, I think it would be fun to have like that brainstorming partner. So maybe someday. Well, I'm just saying the Mick team between McGinnis and McManus. <laughs> There's a marketing campaign there. There's a campaign <laughs> there. Yeah. We'll right. Like an Irish private eye. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. also dark and twisty, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. got it. It's like a Meredith Sorry. Grey. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think we have time for one more here. Uh, Liz asks, do you have any input or involvement in the audiobook productions of your books? I think that could be for oh. both of you. Okay, so great question. And uh, you do, like generally what happens is that they send you like three or four um, snippets of the work and you rank them. Like this is who I like best for blah, 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 blah. And um, sometimes you get them and sometimes you don't. It really depends on the actor, the performer's schedule more than anything. At this point in my life, Brittany Presley has uh, performed, I think, all but two of my books. Oh, so wow. we're at the point now where my editor just says, I just assume you want Brittany to read this. And I'm like, I really do. <laughs> so it's kind of cool because she has, has done 
most, the vast majority of my books. And so she actually sent me, um, she'll send me like a DM occasionally and be like, Hey, this is what, how I think I want to do this. What do you think? And, and we actually have like, oh, that's cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actually have a, you know, a relationship where, um, particularly for this darkness mind, where the conversations between um, the main character and then like kind of her broken schizoid other self are, are coded and, and very difficult to read and have multiple meanings. And Brittany uh, sent me this DM and she's like, how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> she's like, help me out here. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I, I wasn't thinking about the audiobook when I wrote to you. And so she was Sorry, like, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. You so she would run things past me and be like, okay, what if I do it this way? Or what if I do it this way? So it was really, really cool to, to have the exchange with That's the cool. performer that way. Awesome. Awesome. What about you, Karen? Yeah, same. Um, although for my last audio book, which was being produced in the pandemic, which was new, um, my producer who I've worked with on all of them sent over three, just three who she thought were great. She's like, we can look at more if you don't like them, but I think they're great. And they were great. So that was, was a very easy process. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies. This has been a really great conversation. Um, I did drop some links in the chat. Um, which I feel like is a phrase that I had never said before. And now I've said it 5,000 <laughs> Now you say it every time. day. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> but um, it somehow doesn't make me as hip as if I felt like it would have, but that's right. just because I'm old, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, if you have not yet purchased your copy, your signed copy of Mindy's newest book, that link is in there for uh, the initial insult. And then Karen, um, your latest is the paperback of two, can, two of Us Can Keep a Secret. Um, we have that one in stock as well. Um, and I know you've got a new one out later in the year. And Mindy, you're new yeah. one with James and, and all kinds of other things that you can't even yet tell us, both of you can't even tell us about. <laughs> so um, thank you both for creating um, such great work and for sharing it with us both uh, in before times as now. We do really need it, even though some of us aren't as motivated to read. So <laughs> of, course. of course. Thanks but, so much for having, having us. That was great. Everyone. Now everyone go out and read the initial insult because it's awesome. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. thank you everyone for joining us, our attendees here. Um, and if, uh, and of course our authors for spending time with us. And if you did order a book, you'll get an email from event via event combo from us to letting you know when it's ready to pick up or it has been shipped to you. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, thank you everybody. Be safe out there and happy reading. Yeah. Bye everyone. All right. Bye. Bye, bye Gus. I feel like we need to say goodbye to Gus. <laughs> bye Gus. <laughs> Is he sleeping? He's <laughs> behind the laptop sleeping. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy that. All right. You ladies. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.